Greetings, salutations, and welcome to the Krieger Cast. I'm your host, Patrick Krieger, and I'm joined once again by my father, Whit Krieger. Howdy, howdy, howdy again. <laughs> um, we're doing this recording the same day, but my father uh, thought it would be you know, convenient to split it up into digestible chunks. And so we're back at it again, talking about uh, my father's war experiences in part three. So uh, we left off that uh, the Americans came to town. Uh, no, it was uh, the Russians. The Russians actually let us go. Yeah, but the last words on the last podcast were, uh, and then we went to this town where the Americans were. We right. got to the American lines. So, So we went into the American sector, and we thought, wow, this is great, because ultimately our aim was to uh, wind up in, in uh, Germany, and southern Germany particularly. And from what I could tell why they chose southern Germany, my parents, is because they actually thought that uh, some of the ancestors came from that area, because... As refugees, you had to have a reason for going somewhere. Now, um, the fighting had actually stopped by the time we got to uh, Schoenstedt. And uh, Schoenstedt was uh, under American occupation. So uh, we thought, well, you know, at least we don't have to deal with the Russians, and there was certainly no plundering rights or anything like that. And so, um, well, uh, we uh, kind of settled in to figure out how we're going to make it farther west, because um, somehow my dad and my mom had some communication, and I'm not sure how that all went, but the idea was that we're going to southern Germany and there was a uh, large um, entrance uh, or uh, gathering point for refugees in the, uh, in the town of uh, Heidelberg. Anyway. But that's kind of down the road. So let's talk about, uh, let me talk about uh, Schoenstedt for a moment. Schoenstedt uh, being called uh, a pretty town or pretty place because a Stadt or Stadt, Stadt is in, in German is uh, town or city. And Stadt is uh, kind of, it's, it's basically a place. You know, for instance, in uh, archaeology, you know, that common word for um, a place where you find good fossils and stuff and, and that are kind of instructive, they call it a Lagerstätte. Mm. So it's, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, even in America is well known. So, yeah, the Germans, you know, seem to be on the forefront of science and, and make all these discoveries, you know, and so a lot of German words find themselves into the English vocabulary, you know. And, sure. You know. Anyway, uh, Schoenstedt, yeah. It's, it's, it was, you know, a typical medieval kind of town. Um, again, nice and clean because it was in Thüringen, and Thüringen is... Uh, uh, is it's well known. It's it's now it's it's in what what used to be East Germany, and then of course after the reunification became Germany again. Um, Thüringen uh, was known as a uh, they have the Erzgebirge, and uh, so they're they're big in toy manufacturing. There is a lot of uh, handiwork and 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 toys are made wooden toys. Anyway. Uh, to give you an idea of, of um, you know, give you a feeling for the place, the, um, you know, the center of the town, a wall around it, you know, with um, entrances, several entrances. Uh, so there was defense uh, for, from the old days, you know, for raids and so forth. They could defend themselves. So the town had been in, in existence for a long time. Um, population, 
I'm not sure, but it was probably somewhere around maybe four or five thousand somewhere in, in that neighborhood. So it was a small town. And it had uh, a rat house, which is uh, the city hall. And uh, uh, the rat house plots, you know, was an area for gathering the people uh, if they wanted to get news because you had to go there uh, to uh, look at uh, uh, the postings of the news you know they, they would post newsletters and uh, not newsletters but actually pa pages of uh, of uh, the uh, the newspapers the local newspapers or maybe even uh, international who knows but i remember you know it had a kiosk a round kiosk kind of building that um, they uh, posted uh, uh, newspapers on it and people would gather around there you know in that area for Americans, this is those things that you see often in the background photos of European cities. They're like large metal tubes, maybe about three, four feet in diameter, with a little capstone covered in newspapers. Right. Like, they, those have a purpose. Yeah, and that's, that's how people uh, often got their news. But another way they got their news is um, we actually had a town crier. So, the, <laughs> so, yeah, a town crier that came mm. with a big bell. And when you heard Heary, the bell, Heary. it was like that. It was like that. And he, he, had a, he, had, he said something. I can't remember exactly what he said. But, you know, if there was news that was important to know for everybody, they would actually uh, use this town crier to read the news. Hmm. So it wasn't, you know, that that, that was, uh, uh, you know, who got married or anything like this. But it had to do with... Uh, you know, if there was a court case or something really important or the uh, city fathers made some sort of a decision, but he would come around, uh, maybe not every day, but when you heard the bell, you know, everybody came out of their houses or came to the windows. So it had a town crier. Another thing that was kind of charming was uh, we had a church with a steeple, and I tell you, it's hard to believe this, but it had a stork's nest on it. <laughs> and, you know, and the storks would come, you know, because they, I think they fly south and then they come back and have their babies and stuff like this. And the arrival of the storks was an event. It was an event, you know, that was a, a big deal. And we used to go and watch the storks because you could see them. They're big, uh, you know, like, like a goose or something. They're a very know, large a, a bird. Large bird, you know. So yeah, that was that was uh, really something. So uh, we remained in in Schoenstatt for quite a little time. Um, another thing I kind of remember is uh, playing around in the farmers' places in the in the Hofs, you know. And you know, with the kids and neighborhood kids, we used to jump from the uh, from lofts into hay. You know, that was fun. You know, it was really big fun. But uh, another interesting thing that I observed, you know, is when they made pickles, you know, when they uh, harvested cucumbers. And I think that was probably in the fall or so. They harvested cucumbers and uh, they would throw these cucumbers into the into a couple of rotating drums that had nothing but spikes on them. Yeah. Mm. And they would fall. They would, you know, you'd go into a hopper and you'd see the... Uh, the cucumbers, you know, fall being spiked, you know, with these rotating drums that were counter rotate against each other, you know, so that they would transport the pickles down below, and uh, from there they would gather them in big uh, in barrels, in large barrels that uh, had the pickle juice in it, you know, the brine or whatever mm -hmm. they make the pickle juice, and they would seal that up and let it pickle. Yeah. So that was kind of interesting that. And here again, you know, I got to know a horse. <laughs> you know, I should, I should probably get me a horse or something. I don't know. But I got to know a horse. Uh, it was a plow horse, large plow horse. And my job was to, uh, uh, to uh, when, when, the, when the farmer would take equipment out into the field, my job was to, um, to uh, uh, take, take the reins of the horse and uh, and lead it out there. Now imagine I was like 
five going on six at that time. So, um, so that that's how big I was, you know. And and so I I I remember uh, I had I had these shoes. I don't know, uh, you know. I was uh, the shoes were like like tennis shoes, you know, that kind of thing. So was, you know, shoes. And uh, and as I was leading that horse, you know, the horse uh, stepped on the back of my foot, mm. you know, and grabbed my shoe. You know, so the shoe was behind me, and I was barefoot. You know, with a, and so I, I had to make the horse stop. The horse actually kind of knew where to go, what what its job was. So I had to uh, make the horse stop, and I was afraid to um, let go of it. Let go of it, and I kept looking at my shoe. You know, I kept looking at my shoe. So I I, I managed to turn the horse around, and and grab my shoe, but. Then you had to turn it back around. I had to turn that thing back around. It was a large plow horse. I mean, it's something like you, uh, nobody like a rode. It was or something just, like, that. like a Clydesdale. Uh, you know, maybe not a Clydesdale, but it was big and it had large. Of course, I was little. It had uh, large uh, iron sho shoes, you know. And, um, and I thought, oh man, you know, I got to stay out of the way of that one because if it actually stepped on my foot, you know, yeah. I mean, I'd have damage, you know. Anyway. Yeah, that was that was my job, you know. Um, and you know, I got to help the, so so we, I have got to help the farmer, and and how I got to know the farmer is that uh, uh, the farmer actually uh, uh, rented us a um, uh, an apartment in a portion of his home, and the apartment had a a veranda that looked out onto the street. You know, and then inside was, we had maybe one or maybe two rooms or something like that. But uh, that didn't matter, you know, whether it was one or two rooms, because, you know, frequently people would, if you just had a roof over your head, you know, you made your bed. And uh, if there was a stove, then that's where you cooked and you made the bed during the day. And that was it, you know, and then at night you would sleep, you know, there. And uh, But I think we had two rooms because... Uh, you know, we had little ones, you know, there was, um, there was, uh, Walter was yeah. still in the, in the crib, you know, he was now, I, I don't know, one or two years old or something like that, you know. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, it, it, so I had to, I, I, I helped the farmer there would get me to help. I remember one time, you know, he, he said, uh, okay, I'm going to push this cart and you, um, Hang on to the, what is that called where you uh, put the uh, horses on? In German, it's called a deichsel. Uh, you know, it's like a column, you know, that you tie the horses to. I actually don't know, but that does have a very specific term. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's not the yoke. No, it's not a yoke because uh, that would be something the horse or the... Wears. Would wear, yeah. It's uh, I don't know. Anyway, it's a big beam yeah. that... Uh, so anyway, so uh, he told me to hold on to that, and so he could turn the uh, the wagon around inside the hof. You know, the hof was, you know, populated with chicken, and it had, um, you know, it was also it also had uh, cobblestones. Well, I just wasn't up to it because I would hang on to the thing, and that beam would just whack me all over the place. But I didn't let go. I was afraid, you know, never to let go. But that didn't work for him, you know. He thought, you know, I just wasn't up to it. So he, you know, got somebody else to, to do this. But I do remember hanging on to that beam for dear life, you know, because, you know, if you let go of it, you know, it could come back and hit you. Yeah. You know, so I just, I just stayed, you know, hung on to it and it dragged me all over the place there, you know, while he was pushing. Anyway, um, so uh, let's see. My mom, yeah, so you wonder, you know, is uh, what do you do? Do you get free food or anything like this? No. You know, if if you moved into an area, you know, I had to figure out how to get food, you know. And so the way my mom uh, got food is she um, uh, uh, found out, or maybe she knew that before, but she was a good fortune teller. Hmm. This is the first I'm hearing about this. Yeah, well, she could read cards. 
Okay, so she would go and uh, uh, and evidently she had some sort of success because she would um, she she would be invited mostly by women uh, whose husband was in the war or oh. and she would say whether he was dead or or come back and so she must have. Uh, uh, somehow guess that some husbands, you know, would actually come back and don't worry about it, you know what I mean, and soothe their feelings. And the husband came back hmm. and, uh, you know, didn't die in a war. And so word got around, okay? And so what they would pay her with food, you know? Um, they would pay her, you know, would you like some vegetables or would you like a chicken or something like this? Now, if they give you a chicken, you know, that was a live chicken, right? We had no refrigeration, you know, so, you know, she had to, she had to learn how to, uh, how to butcher a chicken and she did, you know, she knew how to, uh, cut its neck and, you know, I, I don't remember actually watching her do this, you know, but I know that she prepared the chicken. Uh, subsequently, you know, I mean, years later I saw her, you know, I actually helped her butcher chickens because you know, refrigeration wasn't to be had until we actually came to the United States, you know, that we, we had, you know, our food was always fresh, you know, so yeah. it was cooked and it was fresh and the bread was from that day, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so they would give her, give her food and things like that. And maybe sometimes even money, I think if, because she was able to buy things, you know, I wish she was here to ask her directly, but you know, now I'm kind of have to kind of guess it, but I do know about, about her, um, ability with cards, you know, um, to, uh, fortune tell, uh, it was something, it was something. In fact, my dad was afraid of this. Hmm. Uh, he, uh, you know, later on when we were in Marbach, you know, uh, she, read him cards and said, you're having an affair. Huh. And he said, no. <laughs> okay. Like a good husband would say, you know, no, hell no, not, not even no. But, uh, something must have been going on because he's give me those damn cards, you know, and he <laughs> tore up the cards and threw them in a the fire, you know, anyway, so much of that. So, uh, let's see, uh, what, uh, okay. So we were in the, uh, American sector, right? In the American zone, which was really nice. So one morning I get up, I happen to look out the window, you know, uh, at the, uh, stepped on the veranda and I said, mom, look at these Jeeps down there. Those Jeeps don't have the white. American star. They have red stars. What in the heck's going on? You know, why are there red star Jeeps down there? And my mom looked out and she says, Oh my God, these are Russians. How did Russians get here? Cheering it. Well, you know, later on we found out, you know, that actually, uh, we probably encountered uh patents group, you know, that, uh, uh, moved into Czechoslovakia and, uh, uh, you know, the Sudetenland and also into Turing and part of that. And he had to pull back out uh, because Eisenhower decided that uh, he would let uh, France and England take Berlin and Russia took the biggest chunk of Berlin. And uh, so um, uh, there was a trade made, you know, of the territory, uh, part of East Germany for a chunk of Berlin, because somehow they thought it was important to have uh, some sort of a presence in Berlin, which was turned out to be a yeah. good thing, you know, but not so good for us because now we were under Russian occupation once more. And the Russians, uh, you know, had more interaction with us. Uh, wasn't anything bad, but once again, my mom was afraid to go outside and, you know, didn't go out much. So people would bring her stuff. You now, so my mom, 
you know, let's say let's say this was 1942, so she was, uh, uh, I mean, 44, so she was 32 years old, uh, 31 years old. You know, she was a young woman. So that, um, and I, I remember, you know, how she put on babushkas, you know, and made herself look old, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, I think the soldiers were on to that kind of stuff. So it was best not to be seen and not yeah. to go out, you know. And, you know, uh, I have to say that all those tribulations, I don't remember any incidents where my mom was assaulted or anything like that, hmm. you know. So uh, that never happened to her. Well, that's fortunate. Very fortunate, you know. So, you know, I think I think also it helped, you know, that uh, Walter, uh, uh, brother Walter was a, was still a baby, you know, and if she'd had to go someplace, she went with a baby, you know. So, yeah, that, that probably was, helps. That was kind of helpful to survive. So, you know, people just did what they needed to do, you know, if you wanted to stay alive. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so the, the Russians were there. But, you know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, like the plundering days. It wasn't anything like that. Um, the first thing I remember is uh, Christmas. Christmas. We, the, the Russians threw a Christmas party for the town folks. Really? Yeah. Christmas of 45? 45. Must have been 45. Huh. Yeah. 45. For, maybe 44. Yeah, 45. It had to have been 45. 45. Because I th in 45, I would have been 6. And I don't think the heart of Germany was pierced until 45. So, like, I don't think there was a winter of 44 where there were Russians in Germany. So, if you had a Russian experience, that should have been in Czechoslovakia or someplace. No, yeah, well... Uh, if it were earlier than that. Yeah, but... Uh, I. The, the, I did have the Russian experience, which we talked about in in, uh, in forty four, I think. Yeah. And uh, so this must have been Christmas of forty five. Could it have been Christmas of forty four? Possibly, but uh, the fighting was over. Then it had to have been forty forty five. Yeah, the yeah. fighting was over. The fighting was over. There was no more fighting. There were no more alarms or anything like that. Changed it was. Uh, was safe. It was now in the occupation time, so it had to have been yeah. 45. Well, anyway, so they threw a Christmas party, and I tell you what, uh, it was it was neat. There was candy. <laughs> there was candy. There were cookies. I don't know where they got those cookies and candy, but the, uh, clearly the Russians were in charge, you know. And uh, each one of us got a nicely painted toy. Huh. brilliantly painted toy like a little truck or a little uh you know some sort of a you know a humpelman or something like that you know humpelman yeah humpelman don't know what that is okay it's those you know the uh it, it's a uh a uh figure that is uh you, you pull you know you hold it on top on a string and then you pull pull down and it it throws its arms and legs out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would not have a word for that, but I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. It's and they're painted nicely and stuff like this. My my guess is that since this was a toy manufacturing area, they probably figured this out. You know where to get them and so forth. But it was nice of them to make those toys available. And uh, then I actually I started school there. So I must have, it must have been, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I actually went to school there. But then, um, my parents, uh, uh, my mom, uh, needed to press on because, you know, we couldn't just stay there, you know, among the Russians. And um, so, uh, you know, some time went by, and they made arrangements for us to uh, to flee the area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this was probably the worst time that my mom and her two kids had, because 
The only trains that we could get were open trains that had no roof. So they actually loaded us with all our stuff into uh, trains that still had cow manure in the, in the, on the floor. Huh. Yeah. I always assumed they were box cars. They were box cars without a, without roof. a roof. Huh. Yeah. Because there was cow manure in there, but they had no roof. And, um, and that was a hell of an ordeal. I because I remember that that very clearly, very clearly, very clearly. So we got into into these trains and now mind you it was winter, okay? Yeah. This winter it was cold, we were all dressed heavily. Um and uh <laughs> So, you know, of course, these were steam engines that were pulling those tra those cars. And so what, what happened is we were in these trains, actually going from one train to another train and so on. We were on the road for 14 days. 14 days in just Germany. In, oh my in just Eastern Germany going to Heidelberg. Okay, for 14 days. Wow. So people starved to death yeah. on that train. Okay, died. And when the train stopped, you know, there was always somebody, you know, taking out dead people. Okay. But for <clears throat> me, the worst was that my mom was able to bundle me up fine. You know, I mean, I wasn't cold or anything. But the worst was is when the train was going in a straight line. That was terrible. How so? Because out of the uh, chimney of the train, yeah. embers would fly out. Hot embers would fly out and they would land on people's clothing and all of the fabric that might be there. Yeah. And so you had to continuously fight fires in the huh. train. And when they went around a corner, then there was no such thing. So we were always hoping for a corner, you know, because, you know, they go around the corner, then it, the, the, the plumes of smoke yeah, and go elsewhere. Uh, yeah. So huh. I'm so familiar with smelling the smoke of steam engines. I can't tell you, you know, I, it's, it's just like, you know, right now I can smell it. it's like being there, you know, that was a good movie, you know, with Peter Sellers being there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, I, you know, at night, I remember the night, you know, the, the skies were clear. It was cold, you know, starry night, wonderful. Except, you know, you would see little fires, you know. They, they usually, for some reason, they didn't uh, move the trains much at night. And, uh, you know, so people would get out of the trains and start cooking in between, you know, the frogs of the, of the rails. They would set that up, you know, start a little fire and then it could put a pot on it. You know, imagine, you know, rails coming together at a switch point, you know, at 45 oh, okay. degrees or so. That kind of makes like a barbecue in a way, you know, I mean. In a way. Yeah. So they would put some fire in there if there was fi uh, wood around, you know, anywhere. And anyway. So Walter was, was, was very young and, and he only survived because my mom was still breastfeeding him. Yeah. But because there was no food really, you know, there wasn't much food. Um, I don't know. There was some bread that we could eat, you know, and, uh, um, and they, they shuffled us around like crazy, you know, back and forth and into the, I, I don't know why. It took so damn long, but it was, you know, my mom talked about that time uh, often, you know, of what happened. Now, she had these five boxes, wooden boxes of stuff, you know, to care for. Another thing that, that happened is that one of, one of her friends had just had a baby, uh, the woman, and... Uh, and I remember the baby's name was Renata. 
which I don't know why I remember that, but it was it was really significant because Renata would have also died if mom wouldn't have breastfed her because the her mom, you know, the was baby's mom, frail. could not feed her. They, wow. She was dry, you know, and she couldn't feed her. So my mom fed these two kids, you know, at least wow. for those two weeks. Yeah. So, yeah, that was uh, that was a hell of a thing. Sometimes, you know, we had to switch trains. And uh, there was actually, the situation got a little bit better because uh, ultimately, instead of the open train, we got into a closed train. But, uh, you know, my mom had to figure out how to get these boxes from uh, one train to the next train. And the way she did that is she would hire somebody to help her uh, bring these boxes either with a hand truck or carry them or whatever, you know. And the way she paid for them is with the th cigarettes. You know, she yeah. always made sure that she had these packs of cigarettes and that's how she paid for them. You know, it's, you know, if you help me, you know, I, I have cigarettes, I can give you cigarettes. And so she did. And that's how she got around. What I remember about that particular, uh, one particular incident when we switched trains it was, yeah, like that. What the hell did you do? Find that. I That's... just I just googled uh, German refugee train 1945. Holy crap! That's exactly what happened. There's photo after photo about this, and people comparing it to the current refugee crisis, saying the current refugees have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to true suffering. Yeah. Um, something that I, I you know I'm kind of uh, speaking from ignorance here. But it's something like there was somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven million Germans uh, starved to death or died of uh, the weather or what have you uh, in 1945 and 46. Yeah, that was that was the worst time because it was the post-war time. There was, uh, uh, you know, no government, basically. Yeah. You know, we had the American government or the French government or the British government or the Russian government. And they didn't know what the hell they were doing, you know, so people had no food, you know. Well, apparently you were lucky to even have walls on your cars. Here's a photograph of some guys that didn't even have walls on the cars. Yeah, ours had walls. Oh, man. Yeah. And sometimes we had to walk between the trains in snow, you know. Wow. Uh, I remember having to walk across... Uh, I think it was a border of some sort. Maybe maybe it was the border into West Germany, you know. But anyway, um, yeah, that was that was a horrible time. That was a horrible time. So, uh, so I I remember you know being in a in a uh, being in a box car, you know that was a really good thing, you know to. But my mom had to leave in order to get those boxes from one train to the next train. And so I screamed my head off, okay? I screamed my head off because I thought I was going to be alone, yeah. you know? But my mom came back, you know, each time she came back and she said, she said, keep screaming, keep screaming because that way I know where, where you are. You know which car you're in imagine that imagine a woman having Telling to do that kid to cry you know yeah you know, you know my mom grew up in opulence you know they were very well off a nice house nice home nice clothes money um she you know she i i remember i've mentioned that before but she didn't really know how to cook yeah. you know my dad said don't worry about that We'll always have somebody cook. And then this happens. Okay. Yeah, this happens. Well, you can't account for the collapse of your country. No. And there was really no choice. If you were German, you were definitely not safe. Now, maybe we could have stayed in Schoenstedt, but my dad uh, wasn't there. 
And it was probably best to leave the Russian territories. Well, we we had it with the Russians, you know, so we did not want to be with the Russians. We wanted to be with the Americans. Anyway, uh, so ultimately, you know, so so actually we took that train to uh, some sort of a railroad station. And uh, when we disembarked from the train, you know, that had a roof, um, we actually got into a, a passenger kind of train. Okay. Okay. So, the passenger train trip, what I remember is... Uh, is sitting there on wooden benches in the train, which was very common. You know, the third class had wooden benches. Second class had, I don't know what they had, but first class, uh, second class probably had, uh, you know, cloth or something like that, you know, something soft to sit on. Then first class, you know, you already had, you know, like a table in front of you, that kind of thing, maybe compartments, you know, that. So, but these were all third class benches, which was fine. You know, we had a place to sit instead of just sitting on a box or on a bunch of rags, you know, or something. Yeah. But the thing was that we hadn't eaten. We yeah. had no food for some time. And, you know, my mom, at this point in time, she told me that we were on, actually on the verge of starvation. We were ready to starve. And... As we, as we rolled into another train station, or maybe it was the train station that we rolled from, a woman came by and gave us, through the window, some bread and uh, one of those uh, uh, Jerry Mesquit kind of, hey, that's why I like Mesquits. Uh, uh, it had soup in it. It had soup in it. She handed my mom that can of soup and uh, a bag, a cloth bag with bread. Huh. Yeah, here. Now, this, this woman was not a German. Okay? She was not a German. She was Czech or something. But they saw the suffering. Yeah. Okay? So... It's funny because you've told me that story, you know, most of my most of my life, and I just you always said, oh yeah, you know, pot of soup, and so I've always wondered that, like, you know, here it is, the end of the war, and someone's giving up their cooking pot. Why? But giving up a mess tin, That's which true. you probably have dozens of lying around from, you know, the army surrendering them. Yeah. That's not a bad thing to give up to give out a little food in. Yeah. That's a. So that makes a lot more sense. So um, we kept some of the bread and shared some of the bread with the people around us because nobody had eaten, you know, for days, you know, if not weeks, you know. I mean, I I don't know, you know, where where food came from. There was no food. Nobody gave us food except at that time. Wow. Which is probably why you remember it so well. So, so yeah, I I remember that woman, you know, uh, and, and I also remember she was not a German, you know. So somehow, you know, we wound for, from Turing and we wound back up in Czechoslovakia. And that probably had something to do with, a, you know, where, uh, which rail lines were not bombed by the Allies. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you can't really fault these people too much because, first of all, communication was gone. Yeah. They had no idea which rails were uh, open. So they probably had to backtrack. So they had to backtrack and all kinds of things. Because I do remember that train going backwards, which was great, you know, because no, we didn't have to fight any fires, you know. Anyway. Mm. Yeah. So we actually had something to eat. We got something to eat. It kind of saved our lives, you know. So then... Um, we came to a train station and took the last train to Heidelberg, you know. So Heidelberg was interesting because the Germans really were organized, you know. They had lists of people, names, mm -hmm. alphabetically posted. So you could, um, 
uh, find the name of a person and a location. So my mom put her name on it. And then ultimately my dad would uh, come and check. There were thousands of people there, you know, in, yeah. in, in co like concentration camps and temporary tents and that kind of thing. And they would uh, check and see uh, whether, um, so she, my mom's happened to <coughs> see my dad's name. So she knew that he was alive. He made it that far. Yeah. And then, you know, after he checked uh, uh, those lists, he found out where she was, you know, and so that's how people found each other, you know, and uh, he found it. But, you know, an interesting thing about, about Heidelberg, um, so th there we were in uh, Americans, and Americans actually gave us food, you know, and there was sandwiches and I don't know what. I don't remember exactly what they gave us, but they gave us food and we, we made it. But probably the biggest thing that uh, that happened is this was also a delousing station. Okay, now imagine this delousing is, uh, you know, how they deloused was with DDT. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they had this, uh, it was like a cardboard or wooden syringe that was maybe, I don't know, four inches in diameter and two feet long. Yeah. And they, you know, charged that with uh, DDT powder and you got one uh, into your clothes down the front hmm. of your neck and down the back. And that's how they deloused everybody. Not in the hair? Not in the hair. Huh. That's, that, that, I remember that powder again. And as a matter of fact, from then on, you could smell it and taste it and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I never did understand, you know, why, why they were so much against DDT here because it really worked. We didn't have lice. I mean, we didn't come with lice, but we didn't get any. From what I've been able to uh, ascertain about DDT is while there's no current known effects on mammals, as far as I know, um, you know, subject to being wrong, uh, it really does wreak havoc with birds. Yeah, it, it, it um, almost wiped out the condors here, you know, so. Yeah, and since there are quote unquote better solutions to our pest problems, you know, yeah, no, not I, I'm not. I'm not saying that uh, that we should keep on using DDT, but I I know that at first, you know, when it really when worked, I, you know, <laughs> I um, you know, I, I, I when I first heard about, you know, oh how bad DDT is, I said, well, I know all about DDT, that, because DDT was around even when we came to Marbach, Germany. Yeah, you know, I mean, they would have trucks going around with uh, fog machines. Just to keep the, the mosquitoes down. That was all DDT. We loved the smell of it. We, we used to run right in there and, you know, get our DDT, you know. Mm. So, and it, it didn't hurt us, you know. I mean, look, I'm, what, 79, you know. Yes, uh, for those of you who don't have the <laughs> visual representation of my father, my father is 79 years old and, frankly, is healthy, healthier than most men in their 40s. <laughs> you know well it's but uh i don't know whether that's you know <clears throat> sometimes i do feel my age but mostly mostly not so much i i think i just kind of ignore it you know <laughs> but um yeah the ddt that was the big thing and so uh, uh we ultimately wound up in uh in marbach and uh marbach am neckar and that uh we should probably tackle that in another session because Marbach is where I really grew up. Yeah. I became a teenager in Marbach and I lived there until age 17. Well, we are at a, basically the same time all the other uh, sections of this had. So I guess uh, join us next time, dear listener, for part four. <laughs> uh, until then, uh, see you out there.